Okay, so we're going to carry on here with our talk about magnetic fields. And um, we talked about the force on moving charges. So now we're going to talk about how these forces are created, just like where we had in uh, the previous unit about electric fields and force. For there to be a force, there has to be a field present. And so if a moving charge feels a force in a magnetic field, then that means it must have its own field around it. Now, we're not going to calculate for an individual moving charge because that's actually fairly difficult. You have to do it in polar coordinates and you have to consider that the radius is constantly changing. So it becomes a fairly difficult problem to calculate it for a moving individual charge, but we just didn't need to acknowledge that it's there. So um, we have a source charge and then we have a test charge or we have a field present and then we have a test charge. So we're gonna kind of treat them in the same way as we did before. And we're going to say that the source is the thing that is creating the field and then the test is the thing feeling the field. So for a moving charge, the strength of the field depends upon the magnitude of that charge how far you are from it, and then how fast it's going. But since that distance is constantly changing, you actually have to calculate this as an integral. What's easier is to look at the charge or the magnetic field of a current carrying wire. Just like we had epsilon naught, and when we talked about electric field, we had its magnetic cousin, we had the mu naught. Mu naught is called the permeability of free space, and that's how easy it is for a magnetic field to move through the whatever material, or in this case, vacuum that you're in. So it's exactly analogous to epsilon naught for electric fields and electric force. Okay, so um, the direction of the field is going to be perpendicular to the velocity direction and to the direction that we're uh, viewing it from. So again, it's another cross product or vector product if we were doing the calculus based class. But since we're not, we just know that we find it using a right hand rule. Okay. Now, what's easier to calculate, actually, funnily enough, is the magnetic field of a current carrying wire or parallel conductors, the interaction between parallel conductors. So if I have two wires side by side, one of them is going to be the source of the field and one of them is going to be the test, okay? One of them is going to feel the effects of the field and the other one is going to, um, the other one is going to be um, experiencing the, or is going to be creating the field. So you have this um, dichotomy here of these two uh, current carrying wires so what we do is we calculate the field created by one of the wires, and then we use that as the thing causing the force on the other wire. So you can look at this picture here. The bottom one is the one that is the source, okay? It is the one that we're looking at the direction of its current flow, and we're figuring out how its field would work. Now for a current carrying wire, the field circles around the wire, okay? So it makes these closed circles. That's what those circles are representing. Then if you look, depending on what side of the wire that you're looking at, the field will be pointing in different directions. So you have to know where your test wire is at in the field. So in this case, the test wire, which is the top one, is above it. So if you look at the direction that those arrows are circling, the field is coming out of the board or out of the page in that picture, okay? So we can use our right-hand rule to figure out the direction of the force. So the bottom one in this picture is the source, the other one is the test. So the way we figure out the direction of the field for the source is we use the curly right-hand rule. You'll notice that that bottom wire has a hand wrapped around it. So you point your thumb in the direction of the current flow in the wire, and then you just circle the wire with your hand, okay? So if this were my wire, if I were on the back side of the wire, my, my field would point up. If I were above the wire, the field would point toward me. If I were on this side of the wire, on the back side, the field would point down. And if I were on the bottom wire, the field would point toward you because that's how my fingers would circle that wire. If I were holding that wire in my hand, that's how 
my fingers would circle that wire. So you hold your right hand with your thumb in the direction of current flow and then your fingers circle around the wire in the direction that the field is circulating, okay? So it depends on where you are, okay? So again, the direction is determined by the right hand rule. So you find the field due to the source wire by using, again, we had to do some calculus to figure this out. So we're just going to write down the result, but I is the current of the source wire and then D is how far you are from it. Okay, so where are you relative to the source wire? Just like R, when we talked about electric field was the distance from that point charge, okay? So D is the separation or the distance and that is tiny little, little thing there. So let me see if I can fix that. Let me go back. Here it is. Okay, so let me do this. We'll fix, see if we can fix that, make that a little bit bigger where you can actually see it. There you go. Okay. So when we look at this formula, if we go back. Mu naughts are constant that you look up. It's the permeability of free space. And then I is the current flow through the source wire. So in our previous picture, that would be the bottom wire. And then D is the distance you are from the source. So in this case, it's the spacing between those two wires, okay? So that lets me find the magnetic field of the source. And then I use that in the formula I learned in the previous sec section about the force on a current carrying wire. Now I can take that wire and its field and I can bend it in a loop. And what that does is that serves to strengthen the field inside the loop and weaken the field outside the loop. So if I bend the wire in a circular loop, what I get is the effect of strengthening the field and making it almost horizontal inside the loop. And eventually I can have a lot of these loops and make a very strong field on the inside. So if you calculate the magnetic field of a current carrying loop, you get this. So it looks like mu naught, which is the constant, I is the current. Now here, R is the radius of the loop because that kind of tells you how many field lines are inside there. Okay, it's not the distance, it's the, it's the size of the loop, all right? So you're looking at the field inside the loop and then N is the number of loops you have. So it's mu naught I over two R, where R is the radius of the loop and then number of loops. Now that tells me then, if you look at this, the field inside that loop is a constant. Okay, because once I build my loop and I determine the radius of the loop, then I know that the field inside it is a constant. And so that's kind of like when I had the capacitor in the electric field section, this is going to ultimately create something called an inductor and it's going to be like a magnetic capacitor. It's going to play a similar role to what the capacitor played for the electric field. So the magnetic field of this loop is depending on how many loops you have, just mu naught I over two times the radius of the loop. Now, if you take a lot of these and put them together, you actually create something called a solenoid. Okay, a solenoid or sometimes called the coil shows up in a lot of places in our day-to-day -day life. If you drove a car today, you used a solenoid because the starter has a coil or a solenoid on it to create the initial burst of energy that that Thing needs to spin the starter motor on your car. Okay, so the solenoid is important. You have, if you used a credit card machine, you've used solenoids. If you've used a doorbell, solenoids, electric guitar pickups have solenoids in them. All right, so solenoids are just lots of loops. So what we often do with a solenoid is instead of looking at, at individual loops, we look at the loops per length. All right, because that's what's going to determine the magnetic field is the loops per unit length. So uh, sometimes instead of N, capital N, we have N over L, which is called the number density of the loops, and we call that a lowercase n. So sometimes it's just easier to look at it that way. So our magnetic field in a solenoid is also a constant. It's just mu naught times the number density of the loops okay, times the number density of the loops, times the current flow in the, in the loop, all right? So it's actually, again, a constant, just like it was for the loops. All right, so that ends this set of notes. 
So we're going to move on uh, next time and talk about induction. We will stop.